inevitably.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Minnesota LCS. I believe this is week four, day two. We are going to go ahead and see Fighting Saints versus UMN, UMN Pocket Picks. I, Dreamer775, am here with Cyber Owl Live. How are you doing today, Cyber? I'm doing all right. I'm just excited to see some exciting League of Legends action here today. So between these two teams, I really haven't spent a lot of time watching the MNLCS. However, you, I know, have been casting it. Between these two teams, which are the one, which are the players that we have to watch out for? Uh, I feel like we ha definitely have to watch out for 007 Varus. He is definitely someone to like kind of keep an eye on. He does a lot of work for the uh, for UMN and PP. Excuse me. And Rivenescence. Rivenescence and 007 Varus are doing phenomenal. And on the side of CSS, we are going to have to look out for Soviet and just the entirety of the bot lane as well, as well as their mid lane. Their mid laner is just amazing in and of in and of himself. But so for everyone that was watching a little bit ago and saw that we were, you know, in Champion Select and everything like that, we were having some te technical difficulties and we were not able to get myself and Cyber into the game 
within the time limit. Some, you know, I don't know what, if it was either something about us not being able to join the custom or whatever, but we are going to go ahead and get into picks and bands. We did see the comps. They're going to pick the same thing. They're going to do everything. It's, it's not going to be any different. We're just in here. So when they are ready to go pick everything, I believe we saw the comps a little bit ago. I could go ahead and break those down for you. Yeah, go go right ahead. So on the side of CSSLT, it is going to be Nautilus, Lee Sin, Gragas, Misfortune, and Morgana, respectively. And on the side of U UMN, it's going to be Kled, Kazix, Oriana, Ezreal, and Nami. All right. They are going to go ahead and pick, pick those, pick and bands, everything. We did see the, like, the. I want to go ahead and touch on the picks and bands as well. I, we've been seeing a lot of Varus being banned away. I, I feel like that's an interesting interesting band just because if with I the must. new update, Varus did end up getting a slight Q buff and nerf. The Q now, uh, the cooldown is much longer, but if Varus is able to go ahead and hit a well, proc no, with his bad. W on that, or the Q with the, with a proc on, it does reduce the cooldown. So it now has to say, hey, Varus can't poke from a distance or not as much unless he gets that, you know, that proc from one of his other abilities. How, would, how do you feel about that? I wouldn't say that's necessarily true in saying that he can't poke. He ha still has the capabilities of poking from very long range with his Q. It's going to be slightly less damage, but at the end of the day, it's still not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I think it was a 15 to 25% decrease, so it's not like dramatic like it didn't go from 150 which what it was was what it was before to like 50 that would have been devastating but it basically forces him to decide okay do i want to have more mana while i poke by auto attacking and then procking my blighted quiver or do i want to go ahead and just keep trying to poke them out of lane so that i can go ahead and free farm a little bit but i'll be oom in the process yeah, well, we won't be seeing a Vars today, so we won't really get to see much of that. But I, we do oh, have the... I will have to also point out one more thing about that, though. That is not currently in the patch. That's PBE, buddy. That is PBE. You're absolutely right. I'm sorry. I've been wa reading too many uh, Surrender at 20 posts, so I got excited. I do. Re you do remind me of that. Thank you very much. But I believe what I wanted to see today if i was correct was the cho'gath but that's something else we can talk about for the later game they are we do see the team comps and everything like that how do you want to break this down like who do you think is going to win between these two team comps strictly based off of team composition there is a very heavy team fight presence coming in from the side of css we do see the nautilus coming in with the leeson gragas with heavy displacement misfortune always a good team fight ad carry it's going to be very reliant on Nautilus and Leeson really being able to dive onto the back line using his depth charge along with Leeson using his kick. However, on the other side, we have a lot of disruption for pretty much all of the engage coming out of CSS in the form of Nami and Oriana. Oriana Ball is a great displacer and also is a great zoning tool. And Nami pretty much just has to throw up her tidal wave, stops Leeson in his tracks, stops Gragas in his tracks, stops Nautilus in his tracks. And also sets up for a possible engage with Kha'Zix jumping in with Oriana Ball. Kled going, popping his ultimate, going in with Oriana Ball. Ezreal poking with his Qs. So it's going to be very dependent on how CSS end up playing the game out. If they're able to pressure bot lane enough and shut down the Nami specifically, it's going to be a lot harder for UMN to take these team fights. However... They have a lot of pick potential in themselves. Oriana and Kha'Zix, I would expect to roam a lot together. Not really going to be trying to pick off the Gragas, as he is very slippery, easy to get away. Maybe going to be focusing on heavy ganks top lane so that the Kled snowballs. All right. Well, Kled, I believe, has been picked up around the third week, and he did a fantastic job in that top lane. So I am kind of glad to see the Kled again. I'm really concerned. Not really concerned. I'm really excited to see how this Gragas mid is going to work. Because I don't believe Gragas has been in the mid lane for a few seasons now. And a lot of that's due to the changes that they've constantly been making to Gragas' kit. They've been making him pretty much just this character you have to play as a tank. You want to take him into the jungle or as it used to be in the top lane and just become this 
humongous meat shield. But here's the thing now is that they started to give him a tad bit more damage. He is not that great in the jungle anymore. I'm not saying he's awful at it. He's just not as good as, say, Kha'Zix, not as good as Rengar, not as good as the assassins that could benefit from using Lethality. So having him in the mid lane might be good if they're able to really get onto this Orianna. It's going to be dependent on how well he uses his cask, though. If he's able to use his explosive cask well enough to completely displace Orianna to his side of the map, where Lee Sin, Nautilus, Misfortune, and Morgana can just go ahead and pick her off, or any of the members of the side of UMN for that matter, the Gragas pick will pay off. However, I don't think in the laning phase it's going to outdo the Orianna, especially with her having both smite or smite, wow, having both ghost and flash. She's gonna be very mobile, very hard to catch. And Gragas, he's sitting on a teleport, so he has no exhaust on him. He has no ignite to possibly secure a kill or to slow down the Orianna. So it's gonna be a lot harder for him to secure kills. Yeah, I do agree with you on that. All right, we are gonna go ahead and say goodbye to this this delay we're going to go ahead and load up into the loading screen i've done this with every one of every caster that i've done or you know talked to who do you think is going to win for sure like no matter what we talked about the team comps we talked about everything like that are you going to give it to css or are you going to give it to umn i'm going to give it to umn and I is that like based UMN... go ahead i feel like umn have more damage i feel like they're anti-team fight composition is going to pay pay off more than the full team fight composition coming out of ccs css all right well because this is who i am and this is and i've always done this i'm going to go ahead and give it to css because i like Being i like difficult? that underdog story but i really want to see this gragas work i think that Wait, nautilus is an amazing sorry. tank amazing top laner at this moment in time I feel like with all the disruption and all of the tankiness that CSS has, they're going to be able to shut down that Kha'Zix or shut down that Kled or even the Orianna to be able to say, no, you're going to come to our side. All right, well, we are loading up. Go ahead. I have a question for you, Sam. Go ahead. So looking briefly at the current items on each side, I want to look strictly at the mid lane. Both of them starting off with the Doran's Rings in two pots. Where do you think this Gragas is going to go as far as as far as his build is concerned? Mostly due to the fact that we don't see a lot of Gragas play, especially in the mid lane. And with the changes to his ultimate, I don't really think you'd be seeing him prioritizing too much damage, don't you think? You, I, I will give you that. I don't see much. He might go end up going that tank build, and I would like to see that. But I feel like he has to go that kind of bruisery kind of way he will be able to build a little bit of tanking i'm expecting a roa i'm expecting maybe an abyssal scepter because he is able to get in there um you know with with his w and everything like that but i feel like he's gonna be able to do damage but be able to tank as well i feel like he's gonna be that disruptor that they really need for those late game two fights I mean, in essence, they already have two disruptors in the form of Lee Sin and Nautilus, so it's not Why like... Why not add a third? I don't see a problem with that. I feel like they'd be lacking damage if they went that route, though. Well, that is, that is very true. But think about it like this. If you're able to tank so much and not die, then you don't have to worry about damage, right? That That's the mentality we have to have here. But just look at the way the mid lane has been playing out thus far. You see how much poke this Gragas is taking. Already forced to pop one of his pots, whereas Orianna's sitting completely healthy right now, full on mana as well, basically. And she's going to be given the freedom to go up and start warding. Did you see Lee Sin warding the back of his blue left, knowing that the Orianna was coming, but now they have a timer. Yeah, they do have the timer. They do understand that, or they do know where Lee Sin is at, and that's very vital information for the side of a uh, UMN. UMN. But, I mean, I'm going to give it to Gragas. You're right, Gragas has had to pop both of those pots already. But this, like we said before, this is a very, very bad lane for him. I feel like once he gets a little bit a little bit of CS, even a few ganks from that Lee Sin, he's going to do well. He's going to get some damage, and he might even be able to just 1v1 the Orianna by himself. 
Uh, I'm not too sure if he'll be able to do it on his own, mostly because Gragas is just not going to quite have that damage. The top lane matchup actually has been pretty in favor of the Kled. We do see that this model is already forced to pop one of his Corrupting Potion stacks. We do see him actually engaging onto the Kled, stuns him up with his passive. And here comes Kha'Zix jumping right into him. He is going to be forcing all of us to flash away. That's going to be the W from Kha'Zix to secure the kill and first blood for UMN. That kill goes over to Kha'Zix, very happy to pick up that extra gold. So with that first blood now in the pocket of UMN, Kha'Zix is going to start being Kha'Zix, you know, just being able to pick off people left and right, snowballing tremendously. Not only that, he also forced the flash out of that Nautilus. So do you think he's going to be making a repeat gank top lane, or do you think he's going to go mid lane as the Kragas is also unbelievably low? I believe he's going to go ahead and actually go and repeat the top lane, just because you're right, Nautilus doesn't have the flash. He's not a, he's not doing really well against the Kled, and Kha'Zix does damage. Oriana's been able to hold her uh, hold her own that entire time, being 7 CS up. Gronkus has already had to go back, use his teleport as well. We're gonna actually see some damage in the, in the bot. And Misfortune forced the flash away from the Ezreal. No follow-up damage coming in here for the side of the UMN, but however, they did force a flash out of the Misfortune. They forced the heal as well. So now, definite advantage here bot side for UMN. They still retain their heal flash as well as their exhaust. So I wouldn't be too surprised to see maybe Kha'Zix making a trip down bot lane to apply some pressure, or at least forcing them to recall. However, he is going to be topside right now, looking to get some pressure onto this Nautilus. He's waiting for the Kled to start engaging onto him. And I don't think Nautilus is aware. There's the engagement from Kled. Kha'Zix jumps in. That's going to be a quick second kill of the game going over to UMN. Kled picking that kill up for himself. Nautilus not really expecting the damage coming out of Kled and Kha'Zix, not respecting it either. Yeah, definitely wasn't respecting it. Uh, Kled did go back, he did end up buying two long swords. I mean, Kha'Zix didn't go back, but Kha'Zix was able to get the isolation damage as well and be able to just pick that Nautilus to pieces. When, like I said, I was expecting the, the uh, return gang top and it worked out for them in the end. So right now, with the way that this game has gone, I'm, I'm going to be curious to see how this Nautilus ends up playing out. Because one thing that I realized after that second kill top lane, he actually didn't buy anything on his first, uh, when he died the first time. He wasn't sitting on those two Doran's rings, he didn't even sit on one. He was still sitting on just that Corrupting Potion, so he had absolutely no health, he had no real damage either. But he had that potion, so it's it's questionable as to his decision making to not at least pick up maybe a cloth armor to mitigate some of the damage coming out of Kled and Kha'Zix. It's definitely very interesting to see that he did pick up a two Doran's rings, and we see a lot of damage on the onto that Kled again, being able to back and get himself a Ruby Crystal. So it's very interesting that he is going the Doran's ring. I do did expect a little bit of a more tanky approach. Who knows, maybe this Nautilus is trying to go a more damage approach just because you're right, they do have the Lee Sin, they do have the Gragas and the Nautilus. Maybe Nautilus is like, hey, maybe I'm the one that needs to play. I don't know. It's definitely a little interesting to see the double door ring, but we'll see what happens from that. I don't quite think that it's going to be the Nautilus going full damage. I think he's strictly getting the Doran's ring so that he can improve his wave clear with his E. With that red side, it's going to be a lot easier for him to start catching up to this Kled. Now he is level 6, so he might have a chance of actually dueling the Kled here. However, it's still not recommended as he is still fairly far behind as far as items are concerned. Looking at Kled having two long swords and a ruby crystal, he has that bit of health, he has that bit of damage. He's going to want to be careful. Here goes Oriana, flashing away from the Gragas. No explosive cast follow up immediately after the flash. However, it is going to be an ultimate and a flash burned on the side of. CC or CSS and flash burned by UMN. Oriana still retains her ghost, but that's going to be a huge engage lacking from CSS now that the Gragas popped his explosive cast. Oh, that was definitely a vi good reaction time on the Oriana, being able to see the flash draw and then the cast. Once she saw that flash, she was like, nope, I'm going to flash away. I know how this is going to work. And we do actually see Kha'Zix kind of getting a little caught out, a little greedy for that ward. He does end up getting the ward and nothing else to retaliate with. But now Oriana has her ultimate and has, like I said, a lot of this, or the ghost. She has, she's very mobile now. So we will see how the Gragas is going to uh, fare 
now that he doesn't have a flash or his ultimate to kind of push it away. Right now, he is actually taking the blue buff, so he's going to be a little bit healthier as far as mana is concerned, as well as being able to sustain himself in the lane very nicely. However, I still don't really think that the Gragas pick is going to really do all that much for him in the long run. We do see Kled going in onto this Nautilus, though, taking him fairly low, forcing Nautilus to sit under his tower. Here comes Kha'Zix rotating in from the jungle, going to be scouting out the blue buff, seeing that it's not there. And now he's making his way up towards top lane. Kled going with the engage, pops his ultimate. Here comes Kha'Zix. There's the Death Card coming in from Nautilus. Kled gets his mount taken away from him, however, it is still going to be a kill going over to Reminiscence on that Cossacks. That's going to be a third kill of the game going over to UMN. Oh my god, so many flashes, so many so many ultimates were popped in there. And you know what? It was Scarl that was able to get out of there, he, but it was Kled. Like you said, he was able to go ahead and engage. He was able to do a lot of damage, and they are going to probably end up getting this top tower and a kill on top of that, and that's a lot of gold. Ooh, this teleport right now is very questionable. Nautilus is still not strong at all. Kled is going to go ahead and finish off the tower. We do see Gragas making a rotation up from mid lane. Kled going to be the one that they're focusing down here. He's going to try and jump away. There's the explosive cast. It's going to get taken fairly low. Stunned up by Nautilus. There's the Riptide. It's going to be finished off with a basic attack there from Knub on that Gragas. One kill finally going over the CSS. Uh, one thing I want to, go I want ahead, to go take ahead. a look briefly at the Nautilus, though. And now... Finally having some armor under his belt. He has the chain vest. So with that, now he's going to be able to start reeling this lane back slightly in his favor. But lacking that tower is going to be really rough, especially if Kled decides to freeze. Yeah, that would be the ideal position for Kled right now, is to go ahead and freeze that lane. Especially since the minions are already at his tower. So it's going to be perfect for Kled to be able to get that... Sorry, get... Uh, get the freezing done, and Nautilus, he's so, he's down in CS. Very unfortunate, like, but he got that chain vest way too late. Probably should have been getting that as one of the first items, maybe trading it out for another Thorns Ring. I don't know. I feel like it should not have happened, but we do see it engaged down in the bot lane. We did see the ultimate coming out of this Morgana, not quite going to be able to stun anyone up there. There's the exhaust being popped on to release in, and bullet time also going out from the misfortune, however, not going to be able to output enough damage to Oriana rotating down from mid lane. Pops her go. She's going to look for the ultimate, not quite going to connect with it. It's going to go ahead and with UMN going to be walking out of that, having blown a few summoners. However, pretty much every form of engage burned by CSS. But here comes Dragas rotating down from mid lane and misses the explosive cast. There is the stealth coming in from Kazakh, dodging out. The Q from Lee Sin, able to keep himself alive. Ezreal tanking up the Q from Lee Sin for that Kha'Zix. Not quite the person you want to have taking damage. But no engage left here for UMN or CSS. They're going to go ahead and go right back to their respective sides of the map. Get back to farming. That was very, very scary damage coming from the Gragas actually. On that Kha'Zix. Kha'Zix having to jump away and almost... I mean, I believe coming down to a quarter of his HP just from uh, Gracchus' uh, Gracchus's abilities, if he did end up landing that explosive pass, he might have been giving a kill over to him, but luckily he was able to get away. There was a lot of flashes in that, in the entire engage in general. Uh, what was it? Nami's flash, Oriana's ghost, um, Morgana flash, a lot of ultimates, a lot of flashes, nothing really came out of it in the end, but it's okay, no one died, so I will kind of give it over to the side of UMN. UMN, they were able to do a lot more damage to the turret, and still, I it was very interesting to see that, I am actually really excited to see how much Rogus is going to do now that he has finished his Roa. It's going to be a while before that Roa starts playing a big factor for this Gragas though, it still has to scale up. It still needs to actually make him tanky enough to survive any prolonged engages. And with the Oriana having this Morella Nomicon, the Kled having already finished his Black Cleaver as well, it's going to be really hard for him to stay alive. We're going to be seeing Kled making a rotation down to bot lane though. Just going to be warding up. He sees that they have a control ward in that tri brush. However, and he's actually going to be starting up the dragon now. Yeah, he is going to go ahead and start up the dragon. Cosmos is going to come down with him. The side of... Uh... The side of CSS does see that they are doing the dragon. There is a ward in there. They're gonna try their hardest to go do something. Ooh, almost got it with the explosive cast, but Kha'Zix will secure that dragon for uh, UMN. 
So having secured that dragon for themselves, that was a mountain drake at that. It's going to allow them to take objectives a lot faster. And with the composition that they already have for themselves, that's going to really be rough for this side of CSS. Mostly due to the fact that it... Oh, wait, no, never mind. It was a cloud drake. Yes. So it's going to get the movement speed. Definitely. And so that's even, actually even not... So, though, that's better. Because that's... Cled and Kha'Zix are going to be able to get right in your face. Exactly. That is not bad at all. Mountain probably would have been the better choice, but Cloud is, yet, yeah, like we said, is not a bad you know, option for them because Kled will be able to run down a lot more. Cossacks will be able to be in every lane practically all at once, or it would seem like it. We do see a little bit of the engage going on to Gragas. Oh, we did see the shockwave come out as well. Cossacks looking for the secondary kill. Yeah, he's going to connect with it. Now they're going to be trying to go in on to Lee Sin. Kled ult is popped. They're going to be dashing right into him. That's going to be a double kill for Ribbon Essence on that Kha'Zix. Able to get that slight speed boost to get the isolation damage on his Q. That's going to be another quick double kill here for the sides of U side of UMN. And now also possibly a mid tower. Nautilus is here to defend it. It's questionable whether or not he's going to be able to do so successfully. We did see Kled rotating him from the jungle. That is going to be another tower here for UMN. Second tower of the game. Kha'Zix being 4-0-1, that is definitely not a champion I would want to see having that many kills and that much damage, especially being this, the lethality that he's most likely going to go for. I I would be scared if I was uh, CSS right now. Yeah, Kha'Zix having already finished his warrior enchantment as well. So he's going to be unbelievably strong. Lee Sin has already also finished his warrior. However, rather than opting for more damage, we do see the Yomu's Ghost Blade being finished on the side of Kha'Zix, where he's still sitting on a couple of tank items. We see the Tidal Wave coming in onto the Misfortune. Bubble connects. There is a Q coming in from this Ezreal. However, not going to be enough follow-up damage to do anything substantial here for 007, Varus, and Oceans of Lotion. We see Lee Sin rotating up towards top lane, looking for, to get some pressure here onto the Kled. Kled gonna walk right up to him. There is the Dragon's Rage. There's the Q from Lee Sin. Kled gonna try and run away. Locks up to Lee Sin shortly. And he's looking for a kill. Get, there's his mount. Gone. Nautilus still trying to return some damage, but he doesn't have his depth charge anymore. So it's not gonna be a kill happening up there on the top side. That was very interesting. I feel like they were trying their hardest to be like, hey, we can get this Kled. But Kled being able to have two health bars because of Skarl. It's like, hey, you guys, you guys don't have that much damage, nor does, you know, not like you said, Nala's had to use a lot of his abilities just to try to even keep Kled in that one spot. But Kled almost being, being able to 2v1 in, in the process and was able to get out safely. Right now, it is going to be a lot of pressure being had onto this bot tower. It is going to be taken after one more hit as we are going to arcane shift away. Going to dodge out that dark binding. And now, 5-1 to one in favor of UMN. They've taken all tier 1 towers here. Lee Sin is bot side. There's the Clyde Ultimate being popping going right onto the Nautilus. Pops his shield over not to do too much. As you can see, the amount of damage he is taking. Clyde just basic attacking him to death. There is the lockup yet again. Not going to be able to stun him, though. We see him still going for the chase. There's the Riptide. It's not going to be enough, though. He is going to get taken down as the Kled gets another kill up there in the top side. 0 4 one Nautilus right now against the 2-1-3 Kled. Kled is also sitting on the Black Cleaver as well as Merc Treads. So with that... those Merc Treads, he's not even going to be close to slowed by that Riptide. Not, like you said, not at all. He has the Merc Treads and everything. But it's super unfortunate. Once Nautilus... Like, once he died that first time, that's all they've been doing. They've been focusing on all this. They've been getting Kled, you know, fed. They've been getting Cossack fed off that Nautilus as well. So I do feel sorry for the Nautilus. I want to say that, you know, uh, CSS might have to put a little bit more attention to that top lane and probably put Nautilus in that box so he can, you know, free farm without much of a problem. See, at this point of the game, though, if they still leave Nautilus to free farm in any way, it's going to put them behind no matter what. So there's the ultimate coming out of the Kha'Zix, though. Explosive Cask is not going to do enough. Kha'Zix able to flash away! He's going to stay alive! He just jumps right out of the fight here. But Misfortune rotating up. The following hitting here. We're going to be popping that bullet time. There's the flash coming in from Kled. There's the death charge. Is it going to be enough to secure the kill onto Kled? Misfortune still looking for the kill. She is going to not quite find it yet. He's still running and she is oh! taken down by Kha'Zix. That's going to be an immediate delete there by Revenessa. Looking for the double kill here. Nautilus not quite going to have enough. It is going to be the double kill here for this Kha'Zix. Revenessa is doing a phenomenal job. 6-0-2 on that Kha'Zix. 
Kleb not quite able to get away thanks to the effect of Misfortune just rotating up from the bot lane. But now we do see a lot more pressure being had here. One for two is still not worth it at the end of the day. One for two, and it looks like they're going to try to get this bot or this mid turret as well. They're trying their hardest. The bot lane is trying their hardest to get the mid turret. And Orianna is at that bot turret as well. So they are getting damage onto these turrets. But I will give Rivenescence all the glory in the world. Being able to live on a sliver of health and then being able to come back. He did end up getting the honey fruit. And there is a fight actually Ooh. going over uh, on the red or on the blue side's red buff. Not going to be able to do much with it. They're just clearing boards and everything. But I do want to give so much attention to Riven Essence being able to get in there, get a kill, and get out. And not even that one kill, two kills, even extending his lead even more. Technically, it was three because they did kill Lee Sin before, too. Oh, I, for I totally forgot Lee Sin was even in there. So, right now, we are going to be seeing the Ocean Drake being started by UMN here. Nine kills to two in their favor. Question is, are they going to be seeing an engage coming from CSS? It's going to be taken by Riven Essence. There's the flash engage by the Dragon. Right into Oriana, able to keep herself alive. Misses the shockwave. There's the card ultimate coming in. Teleport now coming in from the Nautilus. It's going to be the Lee Sin securing the kill with his kick onto Chinger. We've seen Ezreal securing the kill onto Lee Sin. There's a double kill for the Kha'Zix. He's looking for the triple. Is he going to be able to get it? No, he's not. He's not even going to be in that fight. It is actually going to be going to Varus there. So four members of CSS getting taken down here. Two double kills going across. One on Riven Essence Kha'Zix and one on Varus's Ezreal. That's so awkward to say. Yeah, definitely awkward. Trust me, it was really weird when I first started talking. But he was on Varus the first time. But that was super Super good on the side of UM, and they were able to get the Ocean Drake. They were able to do all the damage. I was very confused actually to see that the Grog has decided to go in after the Ocean Drake was taken and not just decide to say, hey, we're not going to do anything with this. So I, that was a very confusing engagement, but it didn't really work for them as Grogus was the only one. He went in and he got out, but the rest of his team kind of died for it. So. I, I want to go back and look at that specific play. It would have been a phenomenal play. And the reason why I say that is because Oriana did nearly die. Here's the problem with what happened with the explosive cast. Oriana was knocked into the dragon pit rather than toward his team. Had, it, had Oriana not been knocked toward his team, she would not have been able to shield herself and force more cooldowns to go in onto her. With that in mind, it, it's questionable as to whether or not they would have been able to actually secure more kills in the fight on the side of CSS had they not burned more to try and kill that Orianna. Like, if Lee Sin didn't have to try and pick her off at the end part of that fight, maybe he would have lived. Maybe he would have been able to focus onto the Ezreal. There's a lot of things that ha that could have happened there had that Gragas ultimate not gone towards the Dragon Pit. There, that was, yeah, I, I agree 100%. And here's another thing, too, is that because they were fighting in the Dragon Pit, you were able to see Kha'Zix go into the Dragon Pit and be able to be like, he he was practicing. Uh-oh, oh, where should we go ahead and see the Kha'Zix? Goodbye. He does so much damage! Oh my god! And this is what I like to call the snowball effect. And this is what happens when a Kha'Zix gets unbelievably fed. 9-0-2 right now, he's sitting on... Edge of Night and Yomu's Ghost Play, so he has 30 lethality right now. We're actually seeing an engagement going in onto the Oriana. There's the Shockwave onto Gragas. Two Shock Barrage comes out. Kha'Zix to secure the kill. He's looking for a double. He gets the double. He's looking for the triple. It's going to be Ezreal securing the kill with a Mystic Shot. That's going to be three more kills going over to UMN. 17 kills to four. Absolutely monstrous play coming in on their side. And this Kha'Zix sitting at 11 one 3 Definitely, in my eyes, the MVP for this game thus far. Unless, unless something absolutely astonishing happens. I did say this before. We were going to want to watch for 007 bars. We were going to want to watch for Revanescence and see how they play. And Revanescence has been doing a phenomenal job being able to get in, get those kills, and get out. He's practically a bunny rabbit. He's hopping around just everywhere. He, was, he did go ahead and max his... Uh, or evolve his wings so he has the ability to do that which is actually quite interesting because of with a lot of the Kha'Zix that I see they ma usually max their uh their Q obviously and they also max their 
uh, Void Spice second, or they evolved their Void Spice second. So I was actually really interested to see that they did, or he did his wings. But I mean, he's able to hop around and get those kills, so I can't say anything else to that. He he knows better than I do. With the lethality on his build, it's ideal for him to be able to jump extremely far into these fights. It basically allows him to get to Misfortune without having to completely focus on his positioning before jumping in. Like we see there, jumping oh right onto this God. Lee Sin and jumping right out of the fight. That's going to be another kill going over the Ribbon as he just melts that Lee Sin. Sino's not having a good game thus far, still only sitting on the Florian Anthem as far as items are concerned. Doesn't even have a dead man's place to finish. That's actually an explicit cast. It's taking away that Baron. We see the tidal wave coming in. It's going to be knocking into the Nautilus. And Clyde also comes out as well. They're focusing down the Gragas. It's going to be Clyde securing the kill. Awesome enough. And now Riven Essence going legendary again. Securing a kill onto that Nautilus. 20 kills to 4. Literally 5 times their kills. So... So they're actually gonna go ahead and try to get him right now. They're oh. actually dead. They, end the, they end his legendary streak. Miss Fort, he was so greedy trying to get that Morgana, and he paid with it. Oh, that's so unfortunate. I, I think he thinks it's bad luck to end a game without having any deaths. That's what I believe. All right. I mean, definitely not what I think. But hey, like I said, he might know better than I do. He actually does end up picking a Dusk Blade right off the bat. Like you, you said, the Sleethality build is just, it's scary right now. I'm actually very, oh God. very scared to see how that's going to work. I feel like a one shot is going to come at any point right now. If he jumps onto the Morgana or onto the Misfortune, they're dead immediately. No question about it. Yeah, we do see Morgana only having a redemption and the eye of the watcher or i yeah eye of the watcher and not even finishing a tier or she only has tier one boots so you're right if morgana gets jumped on she's practically going you know she's gone she's deleted and now they're gonna go ahead and get an infernal as well that's gonna oh, be more damage onto this cosmos or even onto the team of at umn i'm actually really scared yeah, this is going to be rough for CSS to try and come back from. The only way that I can see it possible is if they're able to stall for an absurd amount of time to get Nautilus and Lee Sin back up to par as far as their items are concerned, and even Gragas for that matter. He has a lot of components, but not a lot of completed items. Here comes Kha'Zix, there's the stealth, going in onto the Misfortune, not going to be able to one-shot him. Gets exhausted by the Morgana, also gets a redemption in his face. So right now, both Redemption and Exhaust are now down from Marvelous Maven. They're now focusing their attention onto the Lee Sin in bot lane. There's the teleport coming in from Cliff. Bubble comes out, not going to connect onto Lee Sin. Here comes Kha'Zix. True Shot Barrage does some damage. Kha'Zix going in onto Lee Sin. There's the bullet time onto the Kha'Zix getting taken solo and just barely able to survive. That bullet time, not quite enough damage to come out of that misfortune to secure a kill. We do see him healing up very nicely now thanks to this Nami. This is going to be a very quick tower take here for you, MN. The minions are crashing into the, those Nexus towers as well. Look at the damage coming out of the Oriana as well as the Cloud onto the Lee Sin. Lee Sin gonna get taken down. Sinos gonna be the first one to die in this fight. Now they're focusing their attention onto Nautilus. Gets deleted by Riven Essence with this Q. And now there's the Cloud Ultimate. Not gonna be doing too much. We did see them try to ring them back in with that Oriana Ultimate as well as he dashed in. But aren't gonna be able to do that. This is gonna be the game going over to UMN. 22 kills to 5. 54 and a half, 54.9 thousand gold to 37.2 is an absolutely monstrous game in their favor, and they did not let the neither neither solo lane or the jungler have any fun today on the side of CSS. That was amazing. Like I like we said before, I'm going to go ahead and give Revanescence that MVP going 14 one and three, doing a tremendous tremendous amount of damage being able to practically solo kill anyone that was in his path but i will also give a special recommendation or recognition to the cled because cled was able to do a lot of the cc and a lot of being able to pick people off or give them that speed boost with his ultimate for everyone to get in there and be able to just kill anyone on css so congratulations you umn you guys definitely deserve that CSS. You, you guys, you guys got this next time. Maybe Banacostics. I don't know. It's it was that was just amazing. 
I will say this just to put things into perspective here. Kha'Zix. The amount of damage Kha'Zix did to champions in this game alone was 18,534. Looking at the Lee Sin, Lee Sin did 3,365. There's absolutely nothing that they could have done as far as being able to have Lee Sin reach that same damage spike unless he went full damage and was super fed. But Kha'Zix getting those two kills early on was so rough. And that's what really allowed him to snowball. And that was what the composition of UMN was for. They were meant to snowball, not allowing their solo lane, the solo laners of CSS to get their lead, get tanky, and really forcing them to play their game, playing the pit game and that they were not able to excel against them at. I feel like going back even just to champions, so like they kind uh this CSS kind of gave themselves a very huge handicap with a lot of the laners being very like not very well there's not a lot of early lane pressure coming from the lee sin and there was a, so much damage coming from the Kled. Kled has an immense it has a great early game oriana has a great early game and then just picking up like for css picking up the gragas that was definitely an interesting pick but i don't think it worked as well as they really wanted it to so this might this game might have been even finished at champs to like and we kind of saw it with the Kha'Zix, with the Kled, and even with the Orianna being able to do a great amount of damage in that early game. A lot of it does end up stemming from just overall jungle jungle presence. I We kind of really have to keep revisiting that. Jungle mm -hmm. presence in this game was a humongous factor into how this game ended up breaking down because we saw Kha'Zix pretty much everywhere on the map. He was mid lane maybe once, but his pressure on top and bot side was tremendous. Having been able to get every single dragon in this game and dying only once in total, especially for a squishy jungler like Kha'Zix, had they picked a jungler that either had a little bit more sustained damage against the Kha'Zix, I'm thinking maybe say Vi, who can disrupt the Kha'Zix mid-jump, or who can disrupt him as he is trying to fight and ult him as well. Mm -hmm. Or, hell, if, if they wanted to have that Gragas pick in their favor, they could have put it back in the jungle. Having the Gragas in the jungle leaves leaving room for, say, something with more mobility and more burst in the mid lane, I'm thinking, say, Le well, no, not LeBlanc, because she did get nerfed this patch, I would say more so for... An Echo? Echo would be good. Twisted Fate would be good. Zed would be good. Talon, I think, got nerfed as well. So he wouldn't be the best pick. But Echo, Twisted Fate, and Zed would have been okay picks for this particular game. It would have allowed them to possibly get a little more locked down onto the Oriana and maybe been able to rotate up to really solidify some kills onto that Kled and prevent him from snowballing the way he did to the point where he was basically beating this Nautilus on his own at the end of the day as well, after the Kha'Zix ganks at the beginning. And after that, it's just like, what can we do to stop him? He does so much damage. He's too tanky. We don't have enough damage on our side. We're not tanky enough. It's just overall lacking against the humongous snowball that came from the side of UMN. Yeah, definitely. I will agree with you on that. But we are going to go ahead... Like I said, congratulations, UMN. You did win that one, so good job, CSS. Next time, I believe you. I believe in you guys. You guys can do it. We are going to go ahead and take a little break with our next match being Mavericks versus Ganked by Gophers, and this one I cannot wait for because both teams are undefeated. So we will see how that works. Until then, listen to the music, and we'll be back.
gentlemen, we are back with, I was given actually the wrong information. It is Gank by Gophers versus Gus. Oh, I'm going to mess this up really bad. Gustavus? I'm pretty sure I messed that up. I'm very it's, sorry for you. I mean, you pronounced it better than I would have. I'll tell you that much. Okay. I will probably hear it in the chat somewhere Ready that someone will give me, you know, crap for it. But we are into uh, picking bands already. I do see the Yasuo. We do see the Kha'Zix band. Maybe they saw the Kha'Zix from last game and were like, nope, we don't want to deal with that. I don't know. But I will go ahead and say this, that Gank by Gophers are one of the top teams right now. So that could be a band going, you know, kind of aimed at Potato. So we'll see. But there is another Varus and another and a Graves band this time. I do actually remember uh, literally a Potato picking Graves a lot and saying that he liked it a lot and was, you know, was able to do really well with it. So I feel like they're really uh, focusing on their jungler for now. I mean, I would have to say that the game right now is heavily decided in what is picked for the jungle. Having a lot of strong picks being taken away definitely is going to leave a lot more room for ganked by Gophers and for Gust Gustavus? Correct us in chat, Gust I guess? Gustavus. Yeah, Gustavus. That's, a, that's what I see. That's what I see in chat. Gustavus, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavus. That's all that, uh, I, that I, I've heard from the, hold on, from the desk. Rest. It's Gustavus, I got it. Thank you, thank you, desk. Thank you for telling me that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, see, look at all these jungle bands. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying is we do see a lot of kind of those bands going over uh, those jungle bands. And I'm very, very concerned for that because you're leaving a lot of other champions open. I know literally a potato is a really good jungler, but Whitney Parker, that's someone that we, we're going to be focusing on as well. Actually, just the entire team of Game by Gophers are phenomenal players. So I'm kind of curious to see why so many jungle bands are being focused right now. I would imagine it's due to a specific pick that they want. They banned away two of the stealth junglers, which are Kha'Zix and Rengar, and they banned a very heavy burst jungler in the form of the Graves. I'm imagining maybe something like an Evelyn coming out. Evelyn would be very good having banned away three of the champions that she does very poorly against. And she would be able to apply an enormous amount of pressure, forcing a lot of control wards to be coming out of the side of gank by Gophers. However, it looks like they're hovering over the Rek'Sai, which is an equally strong pick here, especially since Rek'Sai just has a decent amount of damage early, is decently tanky and able to sustain well enough in the jungle and able to invade. So Rek'Sai does pretty much a little bit of everything that Gustavus would mm -hmm. be able to do a lot with that as far as pressure is concerned. Having the Thresh that they just locked in as well means a lot of easy ganks. I feel like with the Rek'Sai though, and correct me if I'm wrong, but because Rek'Sai has the ability to go ahead and see stealth champions or see champions in general when she's burrowed down, I feel like banning away those invisible champions would not have or should not have happened because Rek'Sai can't see those invisible champions. So I'm I'm kind of like yet again I'm kind of curious to see how that goes. We do see the Jin being locked in for the side of King by Gophers and they are kind of hovering around that Zareth which I I mean that could just be like hey we're just going to place this for a uh, placeholder for now. Or I could be wrong and Woody Parker could just say, hey, this is what I'm picking. So we do see the Zareth and the Shen being picked up for Gank by Gophers. So uh, Zareth? Really? Yeah, this is a questionable pick, I have to admit. It's going to be dependent on whether or not he's able to pressure the Zed in lane, which... If the Zed does get locked in, that's going to be a bit of a hard lane for him, all things considered, mostly due to the fact that Zareth does very well, making sure that his mana stays up. Uh, one thing I want to look at, though, moving away from the mid lane, looking at the Shenlock, mm -hmm. they banned Maokai. They lock in the Shen. They're trying to force... Either an AP heavy top lane if they do end up locking that Zed in, or Nautilus. So I feel like they're going to be trying to pick something that, yeah, it looks like they might actually end up going for the Nautilus top lane here. It's the more safe pick. It's the most logical pick here. 
mostly due to the fact that Nautilus is just going to give them the amount of tankiness that they need on the side of Gustavus. But I think UMN played this draft very well in the fact that they pretty much took away the other super tank top laner that isn't Nautilus. Well, we are going to go ahead and see an Ari being picked up, an Ash being picked up. Ash, you know, if it's not a Jin, if it's Ash, if it's not an Ash, it's a it's a Varus. Varus is banned, so Ash is going to go ahead and get picked up on the side of Gustavus. And we do see Wacky kind of hovering over that uh, Azir, and I'm I'm a little curious to see. Yeah, it is an Azir, so I'm going to say that's a Quinn top Azir mid and a Shin support. What Wait, I'm sorry. Hell? Hold on. That's a Quinn. Sorry, I'm so sorry. That's a Quinn jungle, Zareth mid Azir top Shen support. Like I, I'm very confused right now. My I, my whole meta, my like meta is gone. Quinn. Yeah, my met, meta is just out the door right now. I mean, Gank it's not necessarily for... not meta. Lethality Quinn is still really good. What? Okay, uh, that's uh, a pick. Riven, <laughs> Riven into Shen. All right. Okie dokie then. So, yeah, okay, so it is going to actually go ahead and be the Shen up top against the Riven. We do see the Quinn in the, versus the hmm. Rek'Sai, Azir versus Ari, and Zareth as the support. And Jin, so Jin, Zareth, Bot versus the Ash and the Thresh. I like how they played that. I really do like how they played the draft on the side of Gank by Gophers. Having the Zareth actually being the support means that this Ash is going to have to be extra careful about her positioning. And on top of that, it gives them the freedom to pick the Azir. If Ari tries to dash in, Azir just go ahead, Sharima shuffle right into the turret, forcing the Ari to be in a very precarious situation for herself. Having the Quinn there to follow up as well means that there's potentially a lot of very easy ganks here for ganks by Gophers, followed up with a Shen ultimate. There's a, a lot of team fight potential here and a lot of very nice outplay potential here as well. Uh, on the side of Gustavus, I have to say that the Riven is a bit of a greedy pick. I don't think it's going to be as strong as they would hope, especially having the Shen Quinn. I'd expect the Quinn making a very early trip towards topside to deal with that Riven and shut her down as early as possible. Well, on the same side of the same as maybe it could be the Rex side going up into that top lane, being able to say, hey, Riven, we need you for that carry right now go ahead and be it and get rid of Shen, you know, right away. And maybe have the same scenario that it was the last game with the Kled of the Nautilus. Kled getting fed by the rec uh, by the Kha'Zix ganking and ganking over and over. So I don't see that being a really not... I, I feel like that's going to happen, is what I'm trying to say. I feel like it, that has to happen for the Riven to be able to beat the Shen. Because once Shen is able to get that armor... I don't know if Riven's actually going to be able to do much. The question, it, it, I mean, it's obviously going to be Black Cleaver, Lethality, Riven, as mm -hmm. pretty much the only Riven build that actually works right now, especially against the Shen. But here's, here's the problem. No matter what she does early, it really doesn't matter. Quinn with Shen, uh, Stand United on her, just dive into the back line. Yeah, especially There's nothing you can do against that with the composition that they put together for themselves unless this Thresh lands an, a perfect flay or is able to stop Quinn mid-dash with his hook. That, and even then, it's still like you're going to lose somebody in, somebody in this fight, no matter what you do. Yeah, and it, it really it's really unfortunate because if the Riven does end up going for that damage you build, which most Rivens do, that leaves Rek'Sai to be the only one that is the tank on that team. Yes, Shen is the only tank on Gink by Gophers as well, but at least with Shen, he he is very mobile. With Rek'Sai, Rek'Sai has the tunnels, but Rek'Sai has to be burrowed under in the ground to use those tunnels. Other than that, you're not really as mobile as the Shen is. So it's going to be very unfortunate. However, I will give it to Gustavus that they do have the charm. They do have the stun from Riven. They do have the knockup from Rek'Sai, the Ash ultimate, even Thresh being able to hook, flay, ult as well. They have the CC. It's just how are they? It, how is it going to happen in the in a 5e? Because Jin being able to crit every fourth auto, that's going to hurt. If Jin I mean, even gets remotely close to getting a decent amount of farm and everything, it's going to hurt. And especially for that bot lane, that's a cheesy bot lane. 
I'm just going to say that. That's a very cheesy poke bot lane. And I feel like it might actually end up working. There's one thing about Gank by Gopher's comp that, for me, makes it better than Gustavus, and it's the Azir. The Azir wall alone stops Rek'Sai, stops Ari, stops Riven, stops Ash, stops Thresh. They can't get to the backline with all the stuns that they do have. At the end of the day, they're just going to get poked out or get engaged on immediately afterwards. Yeah. So it's going to be a matter of if they can burn it can team fights. If it's going to be a matter of if they can burn the Azir ultimate or kill Azir fast enough that he can't use his ultimate or they end up getting engaged on themselves and attempt to turn the fight and play very reactively. But by playing reactively, you give a humongous advantage to the Quinn and Shen. I do agree. And you also have to remember that Woody Parker does have that cleanse as well. So he's ready for that focus from Gustavus. He is ready for them to go ahead and use the ultimate, use the stuns and everything like that. So he he's he's willing to take that risk. It worked. It's just how it's going to be. But we are loading up into the rift right now. It does look like the standard line of scrimmage from both sides. No one's going to look like to be invading at all. I mean, neither I, team really has that strong of an invade. Arguably, yeah, there's a stronger invade on the side of Gustavus because they do have Monkfish, is on, Monkfish on a Thresh. Mm -hmm. So even if he took his Flay or if he took his Hook, it really wouldn't matter too much. He, has actually, he hasn't actually taken an ability yet. But despite that, it's pretty much just a matter of, oh, we have a potential displacement. We can maybe force a flash, but it's still not really going to be worth it, to be honest. There's not much that they can get as far as a kill is concerned, and the chances of them actually being able to burn a flash without having the damage to back it up is very minimal. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I wouldn't expect them to go ahead and try going for a potential engage here in the early game. I think it's just going to be a lot of farming for the first uh, maybe three to four minutes of the game. All right. Well, I do want to go ahead and give a little bit of attention to the bot lane right now. Jin is actually going to go ahead and start with that long through blue pots instead of the natural Dwayne Blade. I've actually been seeing a lot of lethality builds start with the Long Blade, or, or the Long Sword, instead of the Dwayne's Blade. So I'm kind of curious to see, because with with the Dwayne Blade, you don't have that life steal, you don't have that extra health. Yes, you do have about two extra attack damage, but is it going to be really worth it in this, in this lane? I feel like it's mostly for the pots, less so for the damage. But you don't want to be caught off guard by all of a sudden you're getting burst down or you're going to be taking a lot of ash. So you don't want to run the risk where it's like, okay, now all of a sudden I did start Doran's Blade. Cool, but I can't get close enough to my farm to last hit it to heal it up. And on top of that, I have no more potions to heal me up whenever I'm going to be low anyway. So it's just going to end up being a free lane for the Ash if he had not started the Longsword 3 pots. Alright. Well, like you said, there is a lot of just farming going on right now. There was a little bit of aggression up in the top with Riven, you know, being able to go ahead and hit a lot of the... a lot of her Qs onto the Shen. The Shen was able to heal up just passively alone. But we do, like, I, I want to go back to the Zerith. The Zerith is doing a lot of damage. Oh, I'm sorry. We actually have a... We're going to actually go ahead and see a Quinn being coming up to the top lane. Doing a lot of damage to this Riven, but not able to get the kill. She was able to get away, especially with the Quinn having both of her buffs. Wasn't able to pop any flashes or anything like that. She did end up popping her pot, and that's about it. It was very well played by the Riven up there in top side stunned up the Quinn the moment she got close, because what the Quinn was trying to do was use her E the moment she got close to the Riven, that way she wouldn't be sent back as far. But by getting stunned, the Riven was able to go ahead and dash away without having to pop her flash. Meaning that if the Quinn does revisit top lane, she'll at least still have that extra escape available to her. 
but it's still a very dangerous lane here for this Riven, as we are going to be seeing this Shen have a lot of pressure up here on top side. Even bot lane is being centered super far in. And look how much damage this Riven takes while trying to trade with the Shen. Shen just pops his field. He's like, oh, hey, I'm not going to take any auto attack damage from you, and I'm going to hit you for twice as much. I have Grasp of the Undying. I'm going to try and kill you. More flashes are going to go ahead and get burned here. Shen looking for the kill. There's the dash. Riven dashes away as well. Shen taking a lot of damage here from the minions. Riven maybe going to be looking for the kill here. Looking around, Shen does have his pop going. Question is, is this Riven going to be trying to go for the aggressive play against the Shen? A lot of minions are in her favor, but I don't think it's the right play here. I think she should just opt to back. She's opting to go ahead and recall here instead, which is the smart move here. Definitely. That was very, like, oh. he, he was saying it was very, oh, I'm actually going to go ahead and stop because we do see Jin taking a lot of damage. And we do actually see a gate coming from the Rex side as well. And that's immediately stopped by the Zerath stunning up the Rek'Sai. We do see Quinn having rotated in from the jungle. Quinn was actually sitting unbelievably low. There's another hook coming in onto the gym, getting taken super low. There's the exhaust coming out. First blood going over to Mumpfish on that fresh with an empowered basic attack thanks to his play passive. Unfortunate that they couldn't get that over to not Gosu or to Hidden Shadows, but at the end of the day, they were still able to go ahead and secure themselves first blood. They're denying the Jin extra gold, they're denying the Jin experience, and now they're going to have a little bit more pressure on bot side and allow the Ash to back in safety. I love it. I normally, when I'm in the bot lane, I don't mind if the support does get that kill because, like you said, there's so much being denied. Jin has doesn't get any of that CC oh, or CS, but um, wow, just amazing damage coming from this Shen, and Shen doesn't, he hasn't backed yet. He hasn't backed yet. The Riven was trading with him at full health just now. The Shen just, he popped his field, and it was just like, oh hey, again, you're trying to hit me and you're trying to combo me, but I take no damage. Oh, he actually Ooh. might be eating my words here. Nearly gets taken down here by the Ribbon with a full combo. He's super low right now. Remember, this is a Thunderlord Ribbon. So you saw it did do a decent amount of damage once it did block. And he didn't have his field up early enough that he was going to be able to mitigate that damage immediately. He is going to go ahead and recall here. Picks up a Bammy Cinder, a Control Ward, and two pots. That right there, this Shen is almost going to be unkillable here in the lane. At least until this Riven starts to come online. Maybe with Hidden Shadows rotating up towards top side. However, it'd be recommended if he stayed a lot of his attention in bot side. Especially with the Ash now starting to get a little bit... It, a, get, a little bit pressure against her. Looking at the CS difference, 45 to 35 against the Ash. You want her to catch up to this Jin, and you don't want this Jin to all of a sudden, oh, he has a Yobu. Oh, he has an Edge of Night. He has Lethality. Why am I dying? Because Lethality. Because, because lethality. lethality. Lethality is such a huge thing right now. And it's it's so sad to hear, to hear that because I will say this over and over again until Lethality is nerfed. And they did get a little bit of a nerf. A little bit. It was so minor. That's why I said a little bit. I'm not really like emphasizing it. But until that thing gets nerfed, everyone's gonna go lethality. I've seen so many things, and I and I just wanted to go away. I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That yeah, but Riot should fix it. Oh, Riot should definitely fix it. It's broken, but it ain't broke. Ooh. We are gonna be seeing an engagement happening here on top side. Shed pop in the field. The knockup from Rexai is not there anymore, and. He's able to survive without even burning his... Or he didn't even have flash. But he really didn't have to completely run away there. He was able to trade very nicely for himself. And now he's able to sit up there in the lane. Hidden Shadow is going to be forced to recall. There is the taunt coming in. Not going to connect with its target. And we are going to be seeing the Azir trading very nicely into this Ari. Hidden Shadow is now using ultimate to get to his blue buff. Question is, is he going to be able to take it away from us? literally a potato who's still trying to take it there's the bot lane rotating in fresh not quite able to land a hook getting taken super low there's the sun not gonna connect from the gym he's gonna get taken solo stand united coming in there's the dash literally a potato getting a kill here in the bot side of the map there is the gin ultimate it's going to secure the kill onto the wreck side meanwhile we are going to be seeing the coin falling it's going to be Zerath securing the kill to finish off a three for one in favor of 
ganked by Gophers, they should be able to pressure this turret very easily, especially with the remaining four members still alive here. And I wouldn't be too surprised to see them rotate over to go ahead and take that ocean train. That definitely would be the ideal up uh, ideal plan right after this. They are gonna go ahead and get that first tower. Oh and boy. Actually a lot of damage going on to this Ari! Is he gonna connect? No, nah, Zarath not quite able to connect with his barrage of arcane bullets. And it's going to be them walking away here, Quinn rotating up top lane to deal with the Quinn. Whoa, that is a damage. We are seeing the Quinn having already completed her warrior enchantment on her challenging smite jungle item. So it's going to be doing a significant amount of damage, especially if she tries to go top lane again. Say the Shen is there and is able to land the taunt. That Riven is not going to survive. She's not tanky. She doesn't really have all that much damage yet either. She's sitting on two Doran's Blades, a Longsword, as well as a Caulfield's Warhammer. It, it, what can you do if you get taunted, challenging, smited? Or smitten, I guess. And then you just get bursted down by a coin. Nothing. That's what you do. You do absolutely nothing. The only, only way to counter that is don't go anywhere near them. And that's just going to be super difficult because of the Stand United, because of Quinn's ultimate being able to just get her around the map so easily. And it does look like Gank by Gophers is going to go ahead and re rotate over to the mid, get a little bit of damage from the or onto that turret from the minions. But nothing really else is going to be said about it. It's going to be very surprising to see Gank by Gophers go for a more aggressive play here. We're seeing these Shen engage in here on the top side. Here comes Quinn. No challenge Smite coming out there. She's too far under the turret. They're, they are aware of that. They don't want to go for something way too aggressive without their minions nearby. Rek'Sai is here as well. Bit of damage going down onto Rek'Sai who gets blinded. However, now the Rek'Sai knockup is not available for a few seconds, so if they're able to get a kill onto the Driven, that would be ideal. There's the Jin ultimate coming in, there's two connecting, make that three, is it gonna be four? It is gonna be four! Squiffy able to get the kill onto the Rek'Sai, there's the Jin stun trying to come out, not gonna connect onto the Driven. They're looking to try and get the kill onto the Shen, and oh, Wiki coming in with the clutch kill onto the Riven. Ari popping her ultimate. Gets exhausted by Wiki though, lands the charm. There's the Ignite coming in, stand united onto the Zerath as well. Is he gonna be able to stay alive? No, he is not. Not close to gonna be the one securing the kill onto Wiki. The Jin flashing over the wall to secure the kill onto Ch Chef Big Dog with his final critical strike basic attack. And that's going to be a very hectic fight. A three for two in favor of Gustavus. I have I, that. It, I keep looking at the name and it's just, I want to pronounce it Gustavus, but it's Gustavus. I just got to keep that in the back of my mind. Yeah, uh, I, I feel you. I like it. I like the fact that the Ari went in. She was able to ultimate. There were so many people that were so low. Quinn was so low. Spliffy was so low just from diving onto that Rek'Sai and onto that Ribbon that they couldn't really do much. And they're still fighting up in this top lane. I'm not really sure it's fighting as much as it is just poking each other and saying, Hey, hey, I'm not going to let you back for free. Come on, you're, you're going to have to stay here a little longer with me so that you're going to be missing out in gold no matter where you go. Yeah, However, I... the moment the Yash backs, that's going to be a dead tower. Yeah, you, uh, you are absolutely right because the minions are on there. We do see that Shen is kind of hovering around that tri bush. He is going to get spotted out by the ward. Oh, I'm sorry. Ooh. That Ash ultimate was perfect. Enchanted Crystal Arrow stopping the, the teleport coming in from the Shen. That's going to be a full cooldown on top of that as well. So Riven going to be able to get some free damage here on the bot lane turret. However, we did already see that the bot lane turret against uh, Gang by Gophers has already been taken. So they do get that first turret gold. We are actually seeing the Azir. Using the ultimate after flashing into the Riven. I'm not too sure that's the, quite the play you wanted to go for, but here comes the Riven. Able to assist Witty Parker in securing the kill onto Chasing My Dream on that Riven. Not really able to return any damage. Pops the ultimate. However, at the end of the day, we did see the disruption coming in from that Quinn, which really helped pay off here. And Witty Parker wasn't able to really do all well that much as far as it. If he was there alone, he would have died. Shen getting hooked in by the Thresh, blocking a lot of damage from these Ash Arrows. 
and not gonna be seeing too much damage happening up here on top side. A lot of pressure being had on mid here. Ari nearly getting taken out, dodging this Jin stun, and he's gonna get taken down by Wiki with that Zerath ultimate. You do see Rexai trying to return some damage against the Jin, and Zerath gonna get taken down. Flash in from literally a potato to secure the kill with the Harrier as well. And now we've seen the Enchanted for Stellaro going in onto the Shen. Dashes right through his shield, able to keep himself alive. No return kill happening on the side of Gustavus. Gangplay Gophers doing a phenomenal job thus far here in the early game. 14 minutes in, 9 to 5 as far as kills are concerned. And I'm really looking at this Jin and literally a potato on this twin. They're doing a phenomenal job with their positioning and they're able to output so much damage. I'm, I mean, Jin being able to, every time, every time there's been a major team fight that's happened, he's able to get all four of his curtain, uh, curtain call shots in. And that last curtain call doing so much damage, yet again, critting as well. It's just, it was so amazing. And then literally a potato. Like I said, being able to have that ultimate, be able to be everywhere on that map at once, that's literally what he's doing. He's literally, one, being a potato, and two, being everywhere at once. So it's like, what can you do when Quinn is there, but not there at the same time? I mean, at the end of the day, the Quinn is paying off, yes. I still think that... Gustavus have a chance to try and deal with the Quinn. It's just a matter of how tanky can Hidden Shadows get that when he engages onto the Quinn, if they ever find the opportunity, will he be able to stay alive? And that's the questionable part of this game. And one thing I also wanted to go ahead and point out is the fact that Hidden Shadows took his team's blue buff, denying that from Chef Big Dog on this Ari. Ari needing that blue buff is pretty significant. Oh my god, there's so much damage oh. Unfortunate, having targeted the minion instead of the Ari there at the end. She would have actually gotten the kill with her passive. But the Quinn gonna be forcing Ari back. Ari has no ultimate available now, so that is going to really be good for... Uh, can't find Gophers as far as mobility is concerned. Oh, a lot of damage going down onto this Ash and just barely dodging out that last bit of the Azir ultimate. Trying to dodge the Zerath ultimate. One more is available. Is he gonna go for it? Curtain Call is still out, but here comes the Quinn. Oh, oh my word! Now comes in! Securing the kill on two, not Gosu. Meanwhile, literally a potato going to get taken down by Hidden Shadows. Riven trying to duel with Slippy there in the bot lane. Not quite able to secure the kill. A lot of damage going down onto Hidden Shadows. Jin gonna cast Stand United right on top of him. Wiki gonna be able to secure the kill onto Hidden Shadows with his Q. And now looking for one more hit onto Monkfish. Gonna get taken down. Oh, the clutch heal coming in from Nevervote. Yes, to keep himself alive thanks from that turret. Oh, and so much fighting, so much clutch stuff going on. We are going to be seeing Splippy able to secure the kill on the Chef Big Dog, who's not able to connect with the Q onto the Jin. So no kills going over to the side of this Davids as Gamefight Gophers really start to throw their weight around. Meanwhile, in the bot side, we are going to be seeing that turret falling if just now, thanks to that ribbon. Meanwhile, we are going to be seeing the Quinn clearing out that bot lane wave. We do see the ultimate coming in from Hidden Shadows, looking to try and pressure onto Wiki and Splippy, who are actually going for the trade here. They're going to try and go in onto Ash. The taunt does not connect. The Q from Zeros does not connect either. A lot of damage going down onto Splippy, who slows down the Rek'Sai. We have a teleport coming in from Casing My Dream. There's the hook going down onto Splippy. He's getting the taunt onto the Ash. He will get caught. Is he going to be able to take down the Ash? One more hit should be able to do it. He gets the shield onto him. He's not going to be able to keep himself alive. Not goes through, able to secure the kill onto Splitty. Jin waiting in the wings there. Gets charmed by the Ari and taken down by Chef Big Dog with Riven getting the assist. Standing there for not quite sure what the reason was. However, Nevervote, yes, going to be taken down. Two kills finally being returned by the side of Gustavus. Oh, I, I don't know where to start. There were so many things that were happening, and we're gonna still free to keep going. Enchanted Crystal Arrow comes out. Oh, the hook misses from the Seraph. There's the exhaust. Is he gonna get the kill onto the Ash? No, he is not. Not Gosu gonna be able to secure yet another kill 
for himself. 5-2-3 on this Ash right now, despite the early game that they were having on the side of Gustavus. Now they're really starting to come online. The Quinn trying to secure a kill onto the Ash, able to secure the kill onto not go to. Meanwhile, we do see the Harrier coming in. That's going to be another kill going over to the Quinn. Double kill going over to literally a potato. 15 kills to 9 in favor of ganked by Gophers. After another prolonged engagement, this is what happens when people stick around way too long. I feel like if I'm gonna speak, there's gonna be something else that's about to happen. So I'm gonna try to get this out quick. So much bloodshed, so little time. There was so many ultimates that were used just to kill one person, and now it's Azir's turn to get tower dumped by his own tower. <laughs> oh, I love it! The Shen Talk coming in right onto the Dead United able to keep Azir alive. They're gonna get the double kill onto the ribbon as well. Now they're looking for the third onto Hidden Shadows. They're not gonna be able to find him. Oh, Azir's able to get him! The triple kill! Going over to the Azir winning partner. Looking to get a quadra here. He's not gonna get his first taking that away from him. And now they're gonna be able to get some damage down onto Monkfish. He's getting forced to sit back in tower. He's looking for the quadra. He gets the quad. He gets the gaze. Shut down onto the Azir. Going over to not go see, but 20 kills to 10 in favor of ganked by gophers and that was such a quick and clean fight we saw the sharima shuffle coming out of witty parker going right on to both chasing my dream and in hitting and hidden shadows after taking down chef big dog with that stand united taunt combo beautiful play oh my god it just keeps going cyber it keeps going it's not gonna end i don't know where to go from here there was so many things. I do want to say that Chasing My Dream was trying to go for that tower dive. Oh my god, Zara doing so much damage. Oh the card is coming oh. in. Oh, literally a potato able to secure that last kill. We are going to be seeing Chasing My Dream jumping in from the back line, able to take the kill onto Never Vote Yes. And now we're seeing this thing going down until Ari Split be able to secure the kill onto Chef Big Dog. The ribbon is paying off here. We're seeing the taunt coming in. Flippy is trying to keep his team alive. We are going to be able to see Witty Parker and Wiki able to get out alive. However, they still lost two members on the side of Gustavus. Both Chef Big Dog and Not those who not able to stay alive here. But Chasing My Dream was able to pick up two kills in that fight. Definitely what they were looking for. Oh my god, it happens. It keeps going and going and going. But I want to, uh, we go ahead and try to give attention to the Ribbon. Ribbon was able to go ahead and take out... Uh, never vote yes in a heartbeat and that's what you were saying is we need that ribbon to go ahead and be that carry that gustavus needed so right now ribbon is doing a, a lot of damage she does have her black cleaver she still has her uh caulfield's hammer trying to i'm assuming get that oh and here we go again we're gonna see some engage uh, coming around the dragon pit and there's the engage onto the Azir. There is the Azir wall coming out. Stand United on top of him. There's the stun and kill onto the Ribbon, as well as the Thresh Monkfish. Gonna get taken now. We're gonna be seeing the stun coming out onto Hidden Shadows. That's gonna be three very quick kills and a double kill going over to Witty Parker. In favor of Ganked by Gophers. They're gonna go ahead, take away this blue buff. That goes over to. It goes over to the Zeras support. Okie dokie. I mean, why not? <laughs> why not? He's doing a lot of damage as well. He has so, so much. He has the Morella Namacon. He has the Dark Seal that I'm assuming he's going to change into that Magi sometime in the future, but they're just taking turrets. They're doing so much damage. The team fighting is never ending, and they're on these objectives together as a team. And that's especially what I wanted to go ahead and talk to you about, but we're still having fighting! Curtain call comes out, Flash coming in from the Ash. One more hit, Wiki securing the kill with the Zara's ultimate. One more hit coming in from the Curtain Call, hits Chef Big Dog on the back line, and now it's time for Gangfight Gophers to apply pressure and take this third tier turret. As you can see, them still pushing in. That turret is going to fall almost immediately. The minions are already pushing into those Nexus Towers as well. And now we're going to see this Ari trying to land Q onto this point. Not able to do so. The question is, where's the engage going to come in? We see Zarek channeling the Q. Not going to connect onto anybody. Azir poking with the soldiers onto that Rek'Sai. Hook comes in onto the Shen. 
There's the Ari ultimate, not going to be able to secure a kill, able to dash out and stay alive. Ribbon getting focused down here. Never hope, yes, securing a kill, making a double. Is he looking for the triple? He's going to get it. He's not quite going to get it. Nice able to keep himself alive. He already gets stunned up by the Zeros. It's going to be the triple. Meanwhile, it's going to be a quad well, stolen away by the twin. Meanwhile, they're going to try and get a kill onto the Ash here. He is going to get a double kill onto this twin. Question is, is she going to stay alive? No, she is not. That's going to be the ace going over. Two ganked by Gophers as Woody Parker cleans up that last member of Gus Davis. 31 kills to 15. And such a hectic team fighting game here at the end. But it was something beautiful to behold. I want to say congratulations to Game Fight Gopher. That was the most intense game I have seen so far in this MNLCS. They 100% deserved it. Wow. There were, there were so many things I wanted to talk about, but I never got to just because bloodshed everywhere. Oh, oh I, I, need, I need to take a break from that one. I, I don't even know what to say. I will give you this, though. I will say MVP is going to go over to Azir, being able to do so much of that damage. 23k compared to everyone else. And... He definitely deserved it, being able to do all the damage to the Ari. Not really having to take those ganks in the beginning. Like, he didn't need any of those ganks. He was able to, you know, push Ari out of lane, be able to get the kills for himself in the mid game, as well as be able to use his minions to just maneuver around. And like you said, the Sharima shuffle as well, being able to block a lot of the champions trying to engage off him. He played that phenomenal absolutely and one thing i also want to go ahead and point out was the fact that this azir was such an enabler for the shen ultimates these stand uniteds that came in when he was dashing in with that sharima shuffle really allowed him to just kind of go absolutely ham he didn't have to really worry too much about his positioning in these fights he was able to go in do the damage get out alive and on top of that you have a shen here in front of you now who is basically this giant meat shield especially against the heavy ad composition that came out of gustavus here shen is just like okay hit me you're never gonna get to my azir while i'm here Yes, I, I agree 100%. So if you did a phenomenal job being able to be that tank, be that meat shield. And I just want to say it started with literally a potato, literally a potato being able to roam around, being able to do damage. It was about that top lane. Again, we've seen it twice today, all about that top lane and that those engages, those fights up in there really started you know, the ball for gank by gophers. But another thing I really wanted to focus on was their positioning and they're being able to rotate together once they were able to get that bot lane with that five man dive and everything like that they they got the bot lane turret they went up to mid then they went up to top they stuck together the entire time if they weren't together it was because a shen was down there he had his teleport he had his ultimate he didn't need to be with the team but they stuck together they were able to, to do so much damage so many kills so many objectives and everything I really want to praise Gank by Gophers for being that roaming team as well as being able to do so well that the, co the cohesion and everything was perfect. Yeah, I would have to agree. And just my final point here before we go ahead and get into our break, I will have to say the one pick that really stood out as a problem pick on the side of Gustavus had to be the ribbon selection. I don't think the ribbon ended up paying off how they intended. I would have been much more comfortable seeing them on that Nautilus. Nautilus at least would have been able to do something about that Quinn later on in the game. Yeah, he would have been pressured a lot early. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But Nautilus is still able to have that depth charge to have Riptide as well as the Anchor Toss to really lock down a target. While Riven can lock down targets too, it's not as strong as Nautilus. And when she goes in, she's not nearly as tanky either. I do agree on that. But that is going to be the last point, like you said. Congratulations to Gangfight Gophers. You guys are still undefeated. 4-0. Gustavus has yet to win a game. But I, like I said, I still believe in them. They can do it. 
we're going to have to see how the rest of the weeks go for them. We are going to go ahead and get into about a five to ten minute. I think it's like a five minute break. When we come back, it is going to be Mavericks, uh, the other undefeated team versus McAllister. So please stay where you are and, you know, enjoy the music until then.
right, everyone, welcome back to the third and final game of the MNLCS, where we have Mankato versus McAllister as our final game. I'm actually pretty hyped from the last game, and I'm really hyped to see what happens here. Mankato is another one of those undefeated teams, and they have a lot of potential with Gigabyte in that mid lane. Feels Batman in that top. Those are the two people that I'm going to be looking out for today for Mankato. And on the side of McAllister, it's all about that bot lane for me, as well as Hear Me Roar. Hear Me Roar does a lot of... He, he's pretty good as well, but Feels Batman and Gigabyte, oh my god. If they give Gigabyte Echo, I don't know if uh, McAllister can really do much for it. It's going to be... Very, very intense, at least from my side. I know, Cyber, that you haven't seen much of it, but we are actually going to go ahead and... Oh, I'm sorry. We do have a little bit. We're waiting on a little bit to see what's going on. I think we do see that some of them are ready to go. So what I'm going to go ahead and tell you... Uh, Cyber is Mankato, like I said, is undefeated, and he is. Oh, hold on, we might. Sorry, we might have some typical difficulties. Okay, okay, sorry about that. Having typical technical difficulties, but we are going to go ahead and get into Jamie Select. I will tell you about what's going on with the history of Mankato, but we are going to go ahead and see what the bands are for today. And like, actually, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about it now is Mankato has had a wonderful, wonderful streak so far being undefeated with Gigabyte being that kind of carry. He's always, he's been on that Echo and it's kind of scary to see, especially with Echo being not that pick, not that much of a pick for this, this organization or not a lot of people pick him. But when he does, it's kind of scary. So I will go ahead and say that Thresh is the first one to get banned on the side of Mankato. And we are well, waiting to no, see. We do see a Zach, which is interesting because I don't remember if here to improve actually played Zach. So uh, go Zach's in a good spot though. He's a very heavy ganker. Being able to clear the jungle very quickly while still being super tanky and not having to prioritize damage is a very strong trait that he has. On top of that, dive city that's pretty much what happens when you are playing zach so not too surprised to see to see that being banned away it's actually very commonly banned away in solo queue as well all right well we are gonna go ahead i yet again i think we do have some technical difficulties i do see someone said that their client did crash so same bands will obviously be used i mean wasn't really much it was a zach and it was a thresh but I'm gonna, like I said, I'll go ahead and tell you how I feel about these two. Um, Mankato, like I said, it's all about it's about Gigabyte. It feels Batman. Feels Batman. I be, I believe was the one that brought Pled into one of his games, and I feel has started a trend. Has started a trend with that Cled because Cled, his Cled was godlike it, when he played it, and it was, I was really shocked when it happened. He was able to do exactly what happened in that first game that we saw where Kled was able to poke down with his bear trap on a on a rope and be able to use all of his violent tendencies onto that onto that top lane. And it was it was really nice. It was really nice. So I do want to give, like I said, a special attention to Gigabyte and Feels Batman, but that doesn't mean that no one else on Mankato are not worth watching. So you mentioning the Kled. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So I, I personally know that Kled is not the favorite champion of a certain friend of ours. You know him as well as I do, another fellow caster. Yep. Mr. Yep. Patrick Cypher Soul Flanagan. Shout out um, to Patrick. He's been able to tell me a bit about Kled and the things he actually doesn't like too much about him. And a lot of it actually stems from his ultimate being a bit wonky. And it's actually something I did notice in the first game that we casted together today where the speed boost that the Kled gives after his ultimate doesn't come in right away. It's actually a little bit jarring when all of a sudden it's like, okay, you're walking at your normal so speed, and then all of a sudden, boom, you're automatically right in front of the enemy opponent. It's very jarring, and at times it could be a bit disorienting as well. I think we did end up seeing that when Kled, 
I think they were over at the enemy's I first tower, and they were chasing down the Lee Sin, and all of a sudden you see Kha'Zix and Orianna. They were just like, BAM! Lee Sin is dead now. He was they were just in his face and he was dead. He was running away for his life, but he couldn't because, like you said, Kled's movement speed buff wasn't active right away. So I, I understand that, and I feel like that might end up being a bug. I don't know if it's actually part of the kit where it doesn't start at the very beginning. I'm gonna look into that real quick because I I am very curious. People fear what they can. All right. Well, while you look into that, I'm gonna go ahead. We do have the Thresh, the Shen, the Jin. They're Ooh. getting banned. This is actually the first time we haven't seen a Varus ban, and Varus is actually gonna get go ahead and get picked up on the side of Mankato for that Wickle Bear. And not I'm surprised actually, at all. I'm happy to see it. I've actually picked up a little bit of Varus ever since like the whole lethality changes have happened, and ever since that like one person played Varus and ev like he's been picked or banned this entire you know the, the entire between all the teams he's been picked or banned it was actually Camille as well talking about pick or ban champions that was another pick or ban but because of the nerfs that came to her she is now not even being even thought of but well, I'm sorry I'm gonna go ahead and be say that we do have the Zack, the Darius, and the Syndra. I like the Syndra ban because Syndra is all about that press R to win. And I feel like that's a, a great ban, especially if Gigabyte has Syndra. I feel like Gigabyte will do so much work. I feel like the Syndra pick is still not really worth it. You have the Varus who you want to keep people locked up and close to you, where Syndra is kind of the opposite. I like the Corky pick here better. Corky, as we do know, did get nerfed in this patch, much to my chagrin. His rockets no longer do as much damage as they used to, mostly the big one having a 15% reduction, I believe, compared to what it was in the previous patch. And now it's also possible for the enemy to see your stacks a lot clearer with an extra bar under you saying how many shots you have. So it's a lot easier for them to keep track of it without having to look at the bottom left-hand corner of their screen to see, okay, let me squint here and let me see, can I, is that a six or is that a two? I, I can't tell. Mm -hmm. Ooh, the and, Camille lock-in. Yeah, uh, uh, the, there's the commentator curse. I say it. Camille wasn't even worth a pick. And of course, of course, Mankato's like, no, 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 hold on. You say Camille's not worth it. Let's go ahead and pick up Camille, and I'll show you. So I'll show you if she's worth it or not. This is what happens when you don't shut your mouth, Adrian. I, I just I can't say I can't say anything. I'm just gonna talk about what's already been picked up. I can't talk <laughs> about anything else. You know what? I I just I just I guess I'm not allowed to talk today. I guess it's just how it is. But Iron is gonna go ahead and get picked up as well for it here to improve. And I like Iron. I do want to see how well he's going to fare against the Kha'Zix. Because Kha'Zix is all about that I want to invade, I want to counter jungle, I want to do damage, I'm the assassin. And Ivern's kind of like, hey, I'm going to just, you know, do my thing, la di da di da give some bushes, and give a shield. So Not I do want to see how that's going to work. Go ahead, go ahead. Not necessarily. I mean, Ivern is also a very strong counter jungler. All he has to do is go ahead and start up a camp, smite it right away. That's an immediate take. All yeah, he has to do is take away the Kha'Zix's one extra buff and then just go right to his other buff. That's, but you also have to remember that's if, that's if McAllister says, hey, we're not going to go ahead and ward our buffs. Because you're right, Ivern can't just do that. Can't just go over to a buff, smite it, and take it away, and now he gets a free buff. And he is known to do that, but I don't know. I feel like McAllister's going to be a little bit more wary of that scenario. Braum and Aurelian are going to go ahead and get picked up for McAllister, as well as Lulu and Akali are being hovered over for Mankato right hmm. now. I am okay with the Lulu. Okay, Akali is actually going to go ahead. No, actually, it's not a Lulu. It's going to be a Poppy and a Cassiopeia finally being locked in. For Wait. the side of Mavericks. Who's their support? Is it Evern? Uh, I no Poppy. Poppy. I'm Poppy. assuming it'd be Poppy. Are you or sure? Camille. I, okay. <laughs> I don't think it'd be Camille. I do I've not think it'd be Camille. I've seen a. I think someone. I don't know if it was here or somewhere else, but I have seen a Camille become a support somewhere. 
And it's not that bad, but it's not viable either. So I will say that we are going to go ahead and wait. We do see the corking being hovered over from McAllister. And I actually like the corky being hovered if that does get picked up because Cassiopeia, yeah, she hurts and she can do a lot of damage, but Corky has the range and the Foster's Bombs to kind of counteract that. Corky's early game is fairly mediocre against Cassiopeia because his range isn't as good as hers, especially if she's going to constantly be trying to poison him. However, the mid to late game for Corky is very strong, but as we go ahead and talk about it, it's not even going to matter. It's going to be the Echo lock in here for No Boots. Is it actually the Camille support? Uh, uh, I, I can, no, okay, okay. They're playing with our hearts right now. No, it, it, it's Poppy, Poppy support, Poppy. I get. Poppy, Poppy support's been a thing for a while. I was going to okay. say, the Camille support would have been a little weird. Yeah, it would have been. I thought Poppy was actually going to go ahead into the top lane because Aurelia being able to dash, and Poppy's like, no, I'm just going to go ahead and throw out my Aegis. I just felt like that was going to be a thing, but... No, I guess it's going to be Camille feels Batman says, I'm just going to go ahead and play that Camille while Cassiopeia is going to be on that Gigabyte. So we do, we'll see the Poppy versus the Aurelia, Ivan versus Kha'Zix, Cassiopeia versus Echo, Varus, and Camille. No, they're messing with me now. What is going on? Okay. They're, they're, they're trolling Stop. us. They're, they're trolling they're us troll, specifically. They're trolling the casters. Thank you. Stop with your nonsense. Okay, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait for that lock-in. Well, while you wait for that, oh my god. I am done. I am done. <laughs> I am done with life. I am done with this. Okay. Var, it's going to be Poppy versus Aurelia. I bring in Kha'Zix. That makes sense, though. It, yeah, it does make sense. But the Camille and Varis versus the Alistair and Braum doesn't make sense. But it's going to be like that. So, I... I mean... It makes sense in the fashion that Camille, once she has her ultimate, will be able to keep that ash right in her face. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. Where the hell's your other damage going to come from? You have Varus. Cool, mm -hmm. cool. Varus does a good amount of damage. Mm -hmm. Cassiope, you're going to basically be forcing Cassiope to roam down. Mm -hmm. So that's at, that, that, at that point, it's it. just like... What, you, that's what you're banking on, fine. Or what they could also do is allow the Camille to basically be like the way any support used to be back in the LCS, where you would see her rotating around, just making sure to try and get picks. When she has her ultimate rotate up towards mid lane, secure some kills for Cassiopeia, because Echo wouldn't be able to get out of that. So nice. I would imagine that would be their, their route, I well, guess. I do remember that Camille was played in the LCS as a support, and that's where I was thinking of from before. But I don't, I don't know if it's because of the nerfs and everything. I don't know if it would still be viable. She does have the chance to be like, "Hey, I'm gonna single out a carry." But what I mean, what else do you have? They don't really have anything else for that bot lane other than they have to wait for six for that to happen. Is what I'm saying. I wouldn't be too surprised if they did that because they don't want to possibly give over any early kills over to that Kha'Zix as we saw in game number one with what happened with the Kha'Zix just snowballed out of control. That bot lane is very easy to gank for Kha'Zix. So I would imagine that they just want to play the, all right, let the Ash Braum push in. Let's play it super, super safe until we know we can take a fight. I guess they can do that just because Varus is able to wave clear pretty decently with his with just his Q alone and Camille can help out a lot as well but I guess we are gonna have to just wait and see how that bot lane will react I don't know for all we know they could be just going super aggressive and saying hey screw waiting for them to push in we're just gonna go ahead and make make plays ourselves down here and I'm, I'm gonna revisit a topic that we brought up mm -hmm. Ivern Ivern he has to invade early. He needs to deny Kha'Zix. Even if they ward against the Ivern, what's it going to do? They'll know that he took it. That's it, really. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and here's, something, here's something I want to talk about as well, is Ivern 
taking one of those buffs is going to be able to transfer one of the buffs. I believe it's around level five or six. I don't remember off the top of my head. I will have to look into that. But being able to hand over a buff and keep a buff for yourself might actually be useful for that mid and for that even that bot lane as well. So I do want to touch base on that, but we are going to go ahead and get into the loading screen now. We do have McAllister, sorry, not me. Yeah, McAllister versus Mankato. Uh, how do you, how, who do you think is going to win? Um, see, it's hard to say. I personally am going to give it over to Mankato. Mm -hmm. Their team fighting is very strong. They have the Cassiopeia, they have the Poppy, there's a lot of team fight potential there. Varus follows up with his ultimate. There's just so much lockdown that they potentially have, but again, it's all based on potential. Mm -hmm. They have to be able to execute their combo just as well as they have it available to them. Meanwhile, on the other side, they have a lot of single target damage, which is, the, which is gonna be their downfall if they hit the late game. They have the Echo, Burst down a single target. They have the Ash. Burst down a single target. They have the Kha'Zix. Burst down a single target. They have the Aurelia. Burst down a single target. They have the Braum. Locks down a lot of targets, but focuses more on locking down a single target. So it's like we want to. They want to focus down somebody. Probably going to be Gigabyte or Gigabyte or Wicked Bear. I don't see it functioning into the late game, though. To be honest. All right. Well, I mean, I agree with you. Not a lot of these games have gone into the late game. It has been sort of that mid game, you know, ending or where the game ends is that around that mid game, 30 minute mark. We do have a pause right at the beginning of the game. I think they're talking about the last minute changes with the Camille and the Poppy. I do see a lot of talking about, you know, wrong runes technical difficulties so we will see what's going on there i will say this if i remember correctly them switching at the last second to have the camille going into the support role there's nothing against that happens all the time happens okay. in every esport where they have a trading system in any way uh it, it's a tactic at the end of the day that's what it is All right, gonna see what we have here. Uh, unable to see picks. I think this might be even just a visual bug because I do see that unable to see picks being a comment. So this might be just a visual bug. We might have to restart really quick and see what goes on from there. I am waiting from the desk to tell me what is going to be happening. Uh, I know the for a fact though, there's, but I thought we can have an imaginary desk why not i have I, a desk I, it's right in front of me i have it well not that desk you know what i'm talking about okay from i, I i've gotten from the desk that because of this switch the there was wrong runes being placed, and they are asking if that is allowed for the last minute switch to happen. Because the, because of the switch, the runes were not supposed to be for the top lane, and they are checking the rules to see if that is legal. We actually already have the decision there. Switch base from founder Mitchell from MNLCS says, switching champions is allowed up until any time in the draft, no matter what time it is. If you do not take the right runes and masteries, there's nothing really that you there's can do There's nothing, about that. yeah, there's nothing you can do there. So I guess it is legal for the switching to happen last second. Like it happens a lot in LCS as well. We've seen it happen quite frequently, to be honest. And again, mm -hmm. it, it's a tactic. It's Looking a at the tactic. composition, they played the enemy team's draft the same way that both a Dreamer and I got played as far as casting is concerned. They made us think that it was going to be the Camille top lane. We weren't expecting the Poppy top lane. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it is a strategy and it is legal. 
All right, so we are going to go ahead and wait. We do see the unpause coming in right now. It, it's good. It's legal. Can't do We can't really do anything about it. I guess you got to just be on the ball a little bit more. We will probably get more details later on, but we are still kind of waiting for them to load in as we speak. I'm just going to go ahead and talk to you about now that the poppy is in the top lane. I want to go back to that. I feel like Aurelia is going to have a hard time. For sure about it. Aurelia is not going to be able to jump with that Poppy being able to use her steadfast presence and saying, no, you're not going to, you're going to take damage from jumping onto me. As well as having the Kha'Zix even try to gank, I feel like Poppy's going to be kind of safe up there. Uh, Poppy into Aurelia. Poppy's pretty safe. Just W when Aurelia tries to dash in or tries to dash onto any member of your team that they're trying to help gank. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's like, meh. Uh, you can't do anything as the Aurelia going into that. Um, but here's the thing that I want to look out for, particularly in that same matchup. Poppy and Aurelia are both going to have an impact in a specific way. Aurelia is going to be trying more so to try and burst down somebody, whereas Poppy's going to be trying heavily to peel or maybe get in onto the Ash to enable the Cassiopeia or to enable the Camille. Um, looking briefly at the item starts, it is going to be the target, or the Relic Shield start for the Camille, and we do see the Invade coming in here from here to improve on this Ivern. This is exactly what they wanted to do early game against this Kha'Zix, but now that they rotated around. We do see a ward here for a Mankato as they are going to be having vision of that Kha'Zix red buff. Ivern just going to go ahead and opt to take away his blue instead. Yeah, we did see uh, McAllister going to try their own personal five-man invade, but they were seen and were not able to really do much about it. That's why I believe that here to improve and those Batman were trying to go into the Kha'Zix jungle, but Obviously, the rotate was good. No, no invades. We're gonna start off with a with a normal, normal start. So, I have to ask this question. So, looking briefly at this bot lane matchup specifically, okay. Do you expect to see a lot of early aggression coming in from the Condor, the Condor, and Formic Nightfall? Um. Yes and no, and it, all I'm saying is it has to be Nightfall's Q, or it has to be Nightfall's passive. If Nightfall is able to get that Braum passive early onto any one of those, I feel like this, they can go really aggressive and not really have to worry much about it. We yeah, actually got the oh. Being a bit of aggression here happening in the river. Echo trying to go in onto the Cassiopeia. First blood's gonna go over to the Cassiopeia. Gekabite's gonna be happy to pick that one up himself. Trying to stay alive. He has the potion going. The Echo trying to secure the kill. There's the timeline there. It's not gonna be enough to secure the kill. As feels Batman rotated down from top lane, securing a second kill here for Mankato. Wow. Early rotations from the top lane. And I believe Kha'Zix was trying to go and invade the Ivern with, with, and it cost him his life for it. Yeah, that was a little bit too aggressive. You should have also known that the Ivern was gonna be starting on his blue side. He take, he gets an immediate level two. He doesn't take damage in the jungle all that often. So if you're invading onto him, you're a Kha'Zix, you're gonna have already been taken quite low by that red buff. Because you're forced to start on the side that isn't your dominant side, because he didn't have his bot lane to help him take the camp a lot quicker, he's going to be lacking as far as health is concerned. And then you just saw the results there. You're going to end up both getting yourself killed, as well as your mid laner who tried to roam up and help you. Yeah, that's very unfortunate. As And especially for Cassio King, being able to get that first blood gold. And on top of that, having Poppy being able to get some gold for herself as well. I mean, right now we see that Poppy is doing so much damage up there, and we do see a lot of damage going down here in the bot lane! And a lot of damage going down onto that Braum. There's the heal coming out on for the Camille. Camille able to flash away. Kha'Zix waiting in the wings. Hear me more jumps in. Gets the kill onto Ransack Moose. But here comes the Ivern. 
slows down the Braum. He's gonna be able to get the red buff onto him. But Ivert actually getting caught here. Le Condor able to secure the kill as well as double buffs here early on in the game. And now Poppy teleporting into the top lane, going right onto the slide. Wickle Bear able to get to get the kill here. And that's gonna be two kills for one. And it was in favor of the red side here as they were able to pick up both the kills onto Ransack moves and here to improve. Questionable gank, I'd have to say, because they did focus so much attention onto the Braum. They did focus a lot of attention onto the Braum, but I do want to give good prop over to Mankato for being able to rotate so quickly down to that bot lane. They did end up getting a few kills, but like you said, it does favor uh, red side a lot more just because Ash now has that double buff, and that's a scary thing to give an Ash early. All right, we are gonna go ahead and see just everyone going back to the respective places, and we do want to go. I do want to go ahead and pay attention or give attention to Poppy. Actually, has a ruby crystal and a cloth armor, so she will be able to do a lot of damage and not really take much from this Aurelia, which Aurelia only got a long sword. And we do, and I do want to also say that, you know, Cassiopeia also did end up getting a lot of magic uh, magic damage as well with the Tear of the Goddess. But we are going to go ahead and see a team fight up in this top lane. Aurelia actually is going to go ahead and have to flash away, popping her Corrupting Potion and, get, and living with only a sliver of health while Kha'Zix was kind of waiting to see if Poppy was going to go ahead and kind of follow up on that. Cassiopeia doing a lot of damage to this Echo, getting, actually trying to go oh in, boy. one more attack and Gigabyte is going to get that kill for free. Unfortunate positioning there from No Boots. We saw a lot of damage coming in from the Cassiopeia and she was able to position her poison perfectly in order to deny Echo any movement there in the lane. Perfect zoning tool as well as a humongous amount of damage. Especially having gotten that early kill, it's really going to help amplify Cassiopeia's position in this game. We do see the stun from Irelia going down onto the Poppy. Kha'Zix is there waiting in the wings. Here comes Cassiopeia rotating up from the mid lane. Doesn't get the poison onto the Kha'Zix, who just smites away a minion for his troubles. And Cassiopeia is still on the hunt here. Kha'Zix waiting in the wings, gets the isolation damage onto the Cassiopeia, doesn't quite get poisoned, but he is going to get taken down by Feels Batman. Feels Batman now 3 0 oh, 2. That's a lot of gold to give to a Poppy. And it's again. All three games we've seen this, it's all about this top lane. There's so much aggression going on here, and I feel like it's just, it's never going to end up there. I mean, that's where the pressure has to be at the end of the day. They need to shut down Stride, Swide on this uh, Irelia. You do, you do not want a fed Irelia going off. That's just the end goal of things here, especially when you have a very mobile hero in the form of Varus. You want to go ahead and make sure he's as safe as he can possibly be and denying the Aurelia the chance to really get the ball rolling and get items under her belt is going to mean the Varus is just that much safer here in the bot lane and in team fights. I do agree with you on that, but even then it's still we have the Cassiopeia being 2-0-3, we have the Poppy 3-0-2, three, three, Cassiopeia getting uh, getting a lost chapter right away and a baby cinder and the ninja tabby coming from poppy i don't think poppy's ever gonna die in that lane uh a bit early to say that she'll never die but i will have to say that it's going to be unbelievably difficult for the aurelia to actually secure any kills here we do see cassiopeia trading into this echo here forcing them to pop that honey fruit Oh, a lot of damage coming in from that piercing arrow not quite able to secure the kill poison goes down onto the prime we do see uh, the field going down by no boots. Not quite going to be able to uh, get a kill here on the side of Mankato. But a very good job on their part to just isolate the other members of the members of the enemy team. Echo is going to go ahead and get his blue buff though as we do see Cassiopeia pushing into the turret now. All right, and this is in, this is what I wanted to talk about beforehand is that Iron did end up getting his red buff and there we go. Now you gave Varus a red buff. That, that's that's pretty scary, and we do see, again, Aurelia is just fighting this 
Poppy and <laughs> almost ended up dying. Poppy taking a few tower shots, and Echo actually ends up being in that in a very in or very not safe spot. He's actually gonna go ahead and try to get the Cassie P. Cassie P is actually gonna be able Ooh. to get past a little bit, but Cosmic is gonna go ahead and take the kill. Wow. Ivern is going to go ahead and take the kill on the Echo, but it is an Ivern versus a Kha'Zix and a Grom, but Ivern's going to go ahead and get the kill on the Kha'Zix with Daisy, and now it's just a Brom by himself, and he doesn't know what to do. He's trying to run away, and he will be able to get away. Daisy still doesn't care. Going oh after him oh, in the turret, and Niels Batman is actually going to go ahead and kill the Aurelia, as well as Camille trying to get uh... out of the well, actually end up dying too many tower shots and Enchanted uh, Crystal Arrow, the heal coming in from Varus, and Varus is going to go ahead and be able to live, but wow, a, um, lot, of, a lot of fighting happening again. All right, so let, let's break that down bit by bit here. So, hey, what is it? Cassiopeia, going for the dive onto the Echo, Echo Ultimate, Cassiopeia is has her poison taken off of the Echo because all debuffs are taken off of Echo the moment he pops that ultimate. Cool. Um, with that, though, the kill they got on Cassiopeia, while good, getting the Ivern a double is not exactly the position you want to find yourself in either. But I think the most telling thing... Yes, Poppy got the kill in top lane. To be honest, not all that surprised. Again, Poppy into Aurelia. Aurelia didn't have her ultimate at the time. Poppy was just able to freely go for a dive. I want to look at bot lane. Look, what the hell happened down there? We saw the Camille going in with a heavy engage onto the Ash. The Varus follows up with his ultimate, throws down his E, but doesn't follow it up with the piercing arrow. So Ash gets away, gets the kill onto the onto the Camille, and then Varus is forced to pop his heel. So it's a bit questionable as to the decision to go for that fight, and it may be a bit, a bit of a lack of a coordination, I think. Maybe a little bit of miscommunication on the side of Bot. But, I mean, over overall, I do want to say that Mankito did end up, you know, getting a good amount of kills and damage and everything. Um, so it, I do agree with the fact that they did everything really well. Maybe if Camille didn't die, it would have been a little bit more worth it. But, I mean, we're going to have to wait and see. I, we do see a lot of positioning going on in the mid lane right now. I, we did see Kha'Zix kind of like hovering around there to see if he was going to go ahead and try to gank the Cassiopeia. But I guess if not. We do see this Poppy just doing so much damage to Aurelia, really, uh, and are really not really able to do much about it. Yeah, Poppy is just such a nuisance when she gets ahead. She's sitting on the Bami Sender as well as the Chain Vest. Right now, the Aurelia is sitting only on a Phage and a Corrupting Potion and a Claw Armor. Not really much you can do against that. You don't have enough damage. You're not tanky enough to sustain to survive in these fights either. So it's pretty much just. Farm where you can and try and hope that the poppy goes for a really messy dive. And even then, that's going to be a little bit difficult just because of how tanky poppy is at the moment. We do exactly. see a lot of pinging going on uh, the side of the galaxy, you know, kind of hovering around that dragon. But with how Ivern is able to go ahead and just say, Hi, there's no dragon here with these bushes. They are going to go ahead and get it with no contest. Uh, even if they did try to contest, it was a very risky one if they did try to go for it. Mostly, again, due to the fact that you have Poppy who has teleport ready and waiting. You go for that fight, all you gotta do is wait for Poppy to teleport in. And if the Aurelia tries to fight the Poppy and just negate her teleport by stunning her, then the Aurelia's dead. So at that point, it's like you don't really have all that many options if you're on the red side right now. Blue side definitely having a humongous advantage here. And being able to take first dragon is definitely going to be putting them on the upswing, especially since it's a cloud drake. Meaning Avern can just be that much more annoying for this Kha'Zix to deal with, denying him buff after buff, camp after camp, and allowing Gigabyte to roam on this Cassiopeia that much faster. Well, there was a little skirmish around in that jungle, and we actually did end up seeing that uh, Condor did use his ultimate, so he doesn't have the Enchanted Crystal Arrow at the moment. Oh, and First Blood Turk or Turk is gonna go down, and you see the fight again. There's the Echo popping, his ultimate gets locked up by the Camille, Ivern, and Cassiopeia. 
Hear Me Roar is actually going to get taken down by Gigabyte. Meanwhile, on the back side of the fight, we're going to be seeing a double kill going over to Varus onto No Boots and Fly. They're looking for the kill on TV Ash. They're able to get a Lakondor getting taken down by Gigabyte. Locked up the Braum with that find from Ivern. It's going to be the ace going over to Mankato as Heals Batman secures the kill onto 4 McNightfall. They're going to go ahead and take this bottom tier, uh, this first tier bottom turret as fast as possible. Yeah, they are going to go ahead and do that. I did like how they did engage, and it was all about Ivern shielding, being able to shield. He does have that redemption, and that just right there is scary. That is a utility Ivern, and that is an amazing thing, being able to not really have to worry about getting a jungle item, but all, just getting all that utility, getting all of the shielding and everything, all the health, and it's just, it's amazing. It's perfect. And that's what I really like about Ivern. But I want to go back to talking about Wickle Bear and Moose oh after this fight going on in mid. Cassiopeia getting taken fairly low. The Echo is trying to get some damage onto him. Cassiopeia oh with the kiting! <laughs> poison after poison. Twin Fang after Twin Fang. Able to keep herself alive with that slight bit of healing that Twin Fangs gives when they hit a poison target. Fantastic job there by Gigabyte. Wow, amazing kiting ability, and that is so scary to see that Echo had... Oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, what? Oh, I forgot about Ivern's passive, that's right. Yeah, that's what I was talking Yeah, that's what I was talking about before. But, being e Echo being able to, he like, he engaged on that. He thought he could do it, and it was so close, but he was, it was so hard. And it's very unfortunate. We do see another kind of hunting around here. The Enchanted Crystal Arrow is going to miss though. Yeah, the Enchanted Crystal Arrow does miss. We do see the ultimate coming out of Varus. Ash is sitting too low to participate in this fight. Maybe Echo does throw down the time weather. Here comes Poppy rampaging from the top lane. Redemption comes down onto the Camille from the Ivern. And now off oh, a lot of members here from the red side. How are they going to get taken super low? Oh, and the that is a piercing arrow securing the kill onto Lex Condor on that Ash. Feels Batman not quite able to get too much damage onto Hear Me Roar, but no boots and Formic Nightfall gonna fall as well. Three kills going over to Mankato, and now they're pushing in for this tier two mid lane turret. Wow, amazing. And yet again, it was another thing with Lake Alistair thinking that, hey, we can do this, we can go ahead and engage on it. But of course, Mankato was able to go ahead and rotate themselves and be able to get Two, two of these mid lane turrets, almost for free. I say almost because there was a little bit of, you know, a little bit of poking. Eh, just a tad bit. Just a little. And it does look like they're gonna go ahead and try to get this Rift Herald, actually. I wonder if they're gonna go ahead and give it to the Poppy or they're gonna give it to Camille. I'm assuming they will give it to this Poppy. It makes the most sense to give it over to the Poppy because the Poppy is gonna be the one that has teleport. So you want her to be able to just kind of sit there in a lane, get have that Rift Herald buff available to prevent any potential shenanigans against the Poppy and then it'll just allow her to completely snowball out of control. As you can see right now, she is sitting at 6-0-5. She picked up a Sheen with her last back, and right now, it's most likely going to be an Iceborne Gauntlet, followed up after that uh, Sunfire Cape. As you can see, it is the Iceborne Gauntlet. So now this Poppy is just going to be sticking to you like glue, and she does have the Rift Herald buff on her as well. So with that, it's just going to be like, okay, we have our Squishies in the front line, we have anybody in the front line for that matter they're just gonna die yeah i do want to go ahead and give attention to uh mankato and what they're doing this is what we saw in gank by gophers as well is their ability to group up and to kind of roam together that's what it has been all the time every time that mcallister says hey we i think we can do this let's go in mankato was like no we're also we're all by each other. I don't think you're really gonna kill anyone. So I do I do want to give major props for them being next to each other, being able to roam with each other, and I feel like that's kind of what McAllister is lacking just a little bit. Ooh, nice snare on the Echo, and I will have to agree with you. 
Right now, McAllister not- Oh, wow, nice Poppy W knocking the Braum away, not allowing him to go ahead and jump and stand by the Irelia. So, right now with the way this game has gone, it's going to be interesting to see if uh, McAllister can go ahead and get themselves back into this game. I don't think it's possible, to be honest. Just based on the way that this game has been progressing, they need to shut down this Poppy, but above all else, they need to shut down this Cassiopeia, who's becoming a monster here in the mid and late game. We do see a bit of a stun going down onto this Varus. We do see the Varus ultimate comes out onto the Echo, he's getting taken solo, forced up off his own ultimate. And right now, no kills going over to either side just yet in the top lane. Irelia super low, forced to pop for Transcendent Blades. And it's going to be still farming up against this Poppy. Here goes Poppy. And one dashing into him with her Q securing the kill onto the Aurelia. And now this is a free fight here for Mankato. They do have the Poppy teleport available. Poppy gonna be focusing down the top lane turret. And right now they're still applying so much pressure here in this bot lane. That tower is super low as well. And just the amount of wave clear they had just from the Cassiopeia as well as the Varus is absolutely monstrous. You can see this tower is now going to fall. Nothing that they can really do on the opposite end though as Mankato are really throwing their weight around and showing why their composition's a little bit busted. And this is funny too because I thought in the beginning what we talked about is that this bomb lane for Mid-Alistair was going to be kind of a problem for Mankato, but that's not the case. Oh boy, Camille nearly getting caught up there. Oh, the flash Cassiopeia stun catching two members. Not quite able to get a kill with it though. Now we do see the teleport coming in from the top. The Ivern trying to lock up two members. Gigabyte is able to secure the kill onto the bomb. Meanwhile, we see Wickleberry able to secure the kill onto Yumi Roar. Two more kills for the Cassiopeia. Is she gonna get the fourth? No, she is not. That's gonna be a triple kill going over to Gigabyte on this Cassiopeia. Eight, one is eight right now, an absolute monster. That's an ace going over to Mankato. 24 kills to four. They're looking to end the game here. This, this was an absolute steamroll from their team. They knew their composition was going to snowball very well if they got ahead. And this Cassiopeia did exactly that. Very nice early game roaming from the Cassiopeia, not playing into the typical trope of, oh, Cassiopeia's mid to late game. No, I'm gonna roam early game, help my team, and get myself a lot of early kills, but the really snowball all my advantage. This is gonna be the game going over to Mankato. 24 kills to four at 21 minutes and 35 seconds. A very quick victory on their part, quickest one we've had today. But I'd have to say that was the most dominant performance that we've seen today. I 100% agree with you, Cyber. That was dominant, and it sh that shows right there why Mankato is undefeated. They're, they've done so much work. Again, it feels Batman, Gigabyte, even Hero Improve, Wickle everyone on that team is so good individually, and then putting them as a team together, it's, I don't, I may, they might be able to stay undefeated by the way they're playing. I, with, if they keep playing the way they did today, I wouldn't be too surprised. I will, for me personally, my MVP vote is going to be going to Gigabyte on this Cassiopeia. Phenomenal play. Yes, he ended up dying at one point in this game. However, he was making plays. And at the end of the day, those plays paid off in humongous spades. As well, I will say that you're right about Gigabyte, but I'm actually going to go ahead and give my MVP over to Feels Batman. 8, 0, and 5, putting all the pressure in that top lane, knowing when to teleport, knowing who to stun and who to go on to, being the tank that they needed. I'm sorry, Feels Batman, you did a phenomenal job, and you are my MVP for today. But this will be it for tonight. Just a quick breakdown of that last game. We did see Mankato taking down uh, McAllister. And honestly, that's that's not my best game of the day, though. Oh, no, 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 no. Best, best game, game of the of day. day. Oh. Last game. Oh, I don't, I don't want to say that wasn't the best game, but the most hype game of today had to be the second game. And I agree with you on that. Like, just listening to you, talking, li watching the bloodshed, the consistent team fights and everything like that, I definitely would watch that game over and over again and still be as hyped as I was j the watching it the first time. Definitely. And I'll, I'll have to agree with you 100%.
So as we go ahead and close out week number four, we were hoping to cast more. I, I, I feel like that last game could have gone a bit longer. Maybe they just back to the Baron. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. But hopefully next week's games are just as exciting as this week's. I'm Cyber Owl Live, joined here by Dreamer775. And thank you guys so much for joining us for MNLCS. And tune in next Tuesday for the start of week five. Uh, before we go, I do have to say this. Please don't forget that the MNLCS is brought to you by Invader, bringing some of the best apparel in the state of Minnesota. And you can find them on Facebook. Please check them out. But thank you, Cyber Hour, for joining me today. And we will see you next Tuesday here on this stream.